Hello everyone and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 243. This week the questions are taken from guides 292 and 293, that's HMS Emerald and the Weapon class. And then we have a pair of Wednesday videos, US Navy ship construction in World War II, the big and small ships, plus a look at HMS Cavalier over in Chatham Dockyard. So, let's begin. Lex026 asks, in relation to the Emerald class, you said that she, that's Enterprise, I think, wore her guns out twice during shore bombardments. Did ships with smaller guns have to go into port to replace their guns, or was it possible to do this away from port with support ships? Or could they maybe even bring spare gun barrels themselves? It's one of those things that on paper is possible, but in practice isn't. Now, the reason I say it's on paper possible is because guns on light cruisers, so a six-inch gun typically, actually don't weigh that much. You're talking somewhere between six and ten tons per gun, depending on the exact length of the gun and various other factors. Even an eight-inch gun is somewhere usually between 15 and 20 tons, and destroyer guns two, three, four tons apiece, as opposed to the 80, 100, 120 tons per gun that you have on battleships. And cruisers and destroyers did carry cranes that could lift weights of that kind of nature. If an air, if an, there was aircraft on a cruiser, or you know even the larger of the ship's boats, then the cranes and davits that could be used to raise and lower those craft could also, in theory, raise and lower a gun barrel. But there are a couple of problems. One is that those cranes for the boats and for the aircraft tend to be well away from the main armament and are not exactly portable, uh, and therefore there isn't any lifting capacity directly near the ship's main battery that will allow you to take the guns off. Secondly, it's not just the guns. You also, on most ships, will have to take off the to at least the top of a turret. Or in the case of older ships or destroyers, you might have to remove a gun shield. I mean, in theory, with a gun shield, you might be able to dismount the gun and feed the gun through one way or the other. But realistically, again, you know, compared to on paper, you're going to be dismantling and lifting away the gun shield. Now, that is quite an involved procedure, especially if you're talking about more modern ships with a turret, even Enterprise with her twin turret up forward. And there's weight involved in that, too. And then you've also got the fact it's a fairly delicate procedure because you have to have the gun mounted in the right position so that the balance is correct. And unfortunately, whilst, yes, supply ships with their own cranes can in theory actually quite easily lift a uh, four, five, eight, nine ton gun into place, at least the bigger ones, you have the problem of the ships will be moving. And if the ships are moving, especially if they're in the open seas pitching up and down, or even if they're in a relatively sheltered harbour and they might not be moving that much, with that amount of mass moving around, even the slightest mistake in placement or the slightest swing could see the gun bash into something and that could at the very least knock something out of alignment if not destroy something so if you're going to have your guns replaced i'm afraid it is a dockyard job and as far as bringing the spare gun barrels again in theory you could do in practice it's not really going to work because if you're going to bring a full set of spare gun barrels you're actually talking about adding at least around about 1% to the ship's overall mass on average. In actual, in actual fact, as the ship gets larger, so heavy cruisers and battleships, etc., um, that becomes a greater percentage. But even with a destroyer where it's a relatively low percentage, you're still talking about adding a significant amount of weight up top because something as long as a gun barrel, there's not really many easy ways of lowering it further down into the ship. And also... If you were going to try and replace the guns at sea, you'd have to come up with some way of getting them back out. So deck storage or within the superstructure storage is really going to be your only option. And that's going to have significant impacts on your ship's stability. And of course, it's going to take up a lot of room. So, yeah, unfortunately, whilst any individual one of the items involved could be theoretically done in practice, they're all far too involved far too difficult and far too dangerous to actually accomplish. So when a ship wears out its gun barrels, 
you're back to a dock. Let Musashi Play asks, what was the thinking of Dönitz, etc., from late 1942 onwards, when even though the U-boats were sinking ever more ships, their losses were also mounting? Did they think the losses weren't sustainable, or did they believe they could be offset by the months of full of Allied losses, such as November 42 and March 43? Well, obviously, they weren't happy about the rising number of U-boat losses, but initially it looked like maybe just a slightly sustained spike of losses as might be encountered previously. Um, you can see from this chart, for example, right at the end of 1941, there had been a spike in U-boat losses that was approximately similar to what the U-boat started experiencing in summer 1942, but it had then immediately dropped down again at the start of 1943. And it can be a mistake to think that the Battle of the Atlantic was just pretty much the same thing all the time. You know, U-boats, wolf packs, attacking convoys, the Allied convoy defences just getting better, but the U-boats still slipping in and causing the casualties, but then the Allied efforts just eventually putting the U-boats down. The U-boat campaign was very, very much more complicated than that. Not only were different theatres being opened up, the Caribbean theatre obviously at one point opening up, the US East Coast opening up uh, a couple of times actually, depending on the circumstances. Weather, for example, also forcing changes in convoy routing and changes in how the U-boats operated. The advances in technology, so radar on both sides, radar warning receivers, better torpedoes, better sonar, hedgehog, K guns, Y guns, etc., etc. You know, all of this is coming into play one after the other, and the tactics themselves, which utilize all this technology, are constantly evolving. So, it, a U boat approach to attacking convoy in early 1940 would be very different from a U boat approach to attacking convoy in early 1941, which would be different to how they're doing it in 42, and so on and so forth. And the tactics change almost on a month by month basis not quite but almost and as a result you this is why you see spikes in u-boat losses and then drops because the u-boats will be doing something and it'll work very well and the allies will take lots of losses to their convoys and then the allies will figure out what they're doing and move to counter them and u-boat losses will go up and their effectiveness will go down and then the u-boats will stop and think about that and then they'll figure out a new tactic and then their success rate will go up and their loss rate will go down and so on and so on it goes. So for the beginning of the the spike in losses in late 42, the Kriegsmarine was probably looking at it and just thinking, you know, it's a, it's a bad few months, but we can get through it. And as you said, when we are killing a lot more Allied ships. So once we change tactics again and our losses go down, then it will become sustainable again. And again, you can see in this... Uh, chart in December 42 and January 43, U-boat losses do actually decrease to a level that's, you know, about, it's a little bit above average for what they've experienced previously, but not tremendously. So they probably were thinking, ah, yeah, this is, this is, um, we're back in business, but then the losses start to go up again. And it, although, as again, as you can see, there are a number of drops later in the war uh, as new technologies and so forth come into play. But the the Kriegsmarine was not massively concerned at first. Once it became clear that the losses were going up and were staying high generally, that's when they started to get worried. Because, you know, a spike in losses in any given month may theoretically point to a projection which is completely unsustainable, but it only is unsustainable if the losses keep growing at that rate. Which, even at the worst times for the Greeks, Bruna didn't actually happen. As you can see, they went up, went down, but they then settled at this much higher unsustainable level. Obviously, they didn't stop trying, as you can see by the fact that even in mid, in the middle of the last stages of the war in 1945, there's still a lot of U-boats out there to be sunk, but... It, it gradually began to dawn on the Greeks, you know, that this is probably not going to go the way they want it to. Josh Thomas Moore asks, what was the thinking, if there was any, behind Billy Mitchell's bombings of USS Alabama, USS Virginia, and USS New Jersey with white phosphorus and tear gas, and what was the reactions at the time? Did it actually help his case about air power, 
Or did people go, ah, Mitchell's launched another bias test again and largely ignore him or downplay what happened? Well, at the time, the thinking behind the test from the aerial perspective was we've got a bunch of stuff we can carry into the air, let's drop it on ships and see what happens, or prove what happens, depending on how exactly devoted you were to the aerial cause. Uh, now, of that this is why when the Billy Mitchell tests were undertaken, you had a variety of sizes of bombs, you also had a variety of types of bombs, general purpose, semi-armour piercing and armour piercing. The white phosphorus and tear gas were acknowledged from the beginning that you know these things are not going to penetrate a ship and explode, cause it to explode, but perhaps they might have some benefit in disabling the ship. Uh, the tear gas, obviously, something of a stand-in for any kind of gas weapon. And, well, as you can see here from the old Alabama being hit, the white phosphorus scarcely needs much of an explanation as to exactly what effect that would have on exposed crew areas. But, um, whilst it was a technically interesting idea, the gas option wasn't really thought of that, that as that serious a threat by various navies and it wasn't because they were completely disregarding the role of air power it was because they'd already looked into the idea of gas bombs well gas shells to be more accurate and they'd come to the conclusion that on a ship that's underway any kind of gas payload really isn't going to be that effective whether that's delivered by shell or delivered by bomb because if it landed nearby, then, okay, if the ship is completely stationary, it might have a rather deleterious effect. But when you bear in mind that a ship that's under air attack is going to be moving at its top speed, which even for something like a standard class battleship or standard type battleship is still going to be in 25 miles an hour plus, any cloud of gas released by a near miss is going to be very rapidly left behind. And any gas that lands on the deck, well, one, once you're at general quarters or action stations depending on which navy you're in you really shouldn't have that many people out on deck so something that hits and explodes on deck not really going to be much of a problem except maybe for people on the bridge if they choose to remain on the open areas of the bridge and even if a bomb hits and penetrates a deck or so down once a crew is actually all ready for combat there's also not a tremendous amount even one deck further down that you're going to really do much to so you know if you hit near a main turret and you go through one deck or two well it's largely going to be crew quarters and messes now that might be a bit of an inconvenience for the ship later on when the crew have to come back but assuming the ship is all locked up and the crew are in the turrets and in the barbettes etc it's not going to make a huge amount of difference um now a very large bomb like a thousand or two thousand pound might be able to carry a considerable amount of gas which could cause the upper decks to be somewhat hazardous for a while but it, it wasn't really a, a huge threat about the biggest threat would be maybe if one got into a casement deck but you know by the time of mitchell's test people were already moving over to turreted secondaries the white phosphorus is something of a different issue for obvious reasons. The fumes, the burning, the fact it tends to stick to things. That could pose a significant threat to lookout crews um, and people in fighting tops and rangefinder positions. Bearing in mind, obviously, this is a pre-radar, so that's your optical fire control positions potentially having issues. Uh, the bridge crew, obviously, if they're choosing to remain out on the open bridges, they would have to get into cover rather sharpish if they're not killed outright aircraft that were on deck um that hadn't yet been launched would probably become very rapidly unserviceable and of course it would also be quite detrimental to the crews of anti-aircraft guns who are usually working from open gun mounts or shielded gun mounts which would be significantly vulnerable but it's a still a relatively minor dilution of the ship's overall fighting power because it will have other rangefinders it can work on and so on and so forth. And for all the expense and trouble you've gone to of getting a bomber close enough to drop a white phosphorus bomb on the ship, and you probably will have cost you a bunch of aircraft to get there, 
you probably should have dropped something that might actually, you know, stop the ship, like a high-capacity armor armor piercing bomb or something like that, because otherwise you've minorly inconvenienced it. So they they were interesting to see what the effects might be, especially on stationary vessels. But m like a lot of Mitchell's tests, they do tend to get overblown. At some point next year, I'm probably going to do a video about Mitchell's tests and point out just how overblown and how ridiculous they actually were. Hendrik asks, Was there any reasonable way for the Kriegsmarine to retain their shipbuilding knowledge after World War I, and why didn't they ask the Italians or the Japanese for assistance? There were a few ways, and they did try. Uh, for example, there was a rather suspicious company opened in the Netherlands, which just so happened to specialise in submarine design and was named in a very German way and had a lot of very German staff and designed things that looked very much like follow-on designs from the German U-boats of World War One. But it was in the Netherlands, so it wasn't illegal. Um, so they, that's one of the ways they tried to maintain their submarine design knowledge. And, of course, there was a limited capacity for them to design and build ships within the confines of the Versailles Treaty, hence Emden, the Königsbergs, the Leipzigs, the, um, the Deutschlands, some of their destroyers, etc. So, you know, small ship, if you like, design was still possible. But when it comes to larger ships, so full-sized treaty cruisers and battleships, carriers, I suppose they did try and build some of them as well, there wasn't really much that they could do in the period where everything was, you know, when they lost all of this capability, because that's in the 1920s and very early 30s in the middle of the first treaty, Washington Treaty mandated design holiday. So although the bigger navies are working on refits and modernizations of their existing ships. They're working on theoretical designs of what they might build once the treaty is over, um, or once the building holiday at least has expired. The Germans can't do any of that because they don't have any big battleships to maintain. They don't have any realistic possibility under the treaties of building anything of that size once the period has come to an end so if they start designing anything then well that's going to be incredibly suspicious and they can't really afford to have people designing secret paper ships anyway because germany is well trying to pay off a massive war indemnity and then thanks to the massive inflation towards the end of the 1920s is pretty much flat out broke so uh, relatively unnecessary naval design bureau section that's built that's designing theoretical treaty battleships is not going to survive those budgets whereas you know a small section that's designing destroyers and torpedo boats might very well manage to and as for why they didn't ask for the italians or japanese for help well you've got to remember that germany and italy only formally allied themselves in 1936 by which point germany was already well on its way to building its own capital ships anyway and the formal alliance with Japan didn't actually come about until 1940, by which point every German battleship they were ever going to build had already been laid down and substantially actually already been completed in the case of the Bismarcks. So in terms of asking an, an ally for help, by the time they had them, it was too late. And in terms of asking them for help beforehand, well... At th those stages, in the early 1930s and in the 1920s, both the Italian and Japanese hands would have been tied somewhat by the fact that they were signatories to the Washington and later London Naval Treaties, which, you know, forbids things like spreading and selling battleships around, and probably, if you squint and look at it sideways, could be interpreted in terms of sharing skills. Now, obviously, Italy did share some skills with Russia, but one, that came somewhat after Italy decided it wasn't really going to hold to the treaties anyway, and two, Russia wasn't bound by any particular treaty, whereas Germany certainly was. So, you know, hiring or staff to design German battleships would have pulled up some fairly large red flags, and in terms of German engineers heading over in any quantity 
to Japan or Italy to learn how to design capital ships. Well, one, they would have been learning how to design Japanese and Italian capital ships, which are not necessarily going to be ideally suited for the roles that the Germans would want. And second, any large magical outflux of German naval design engineers to those countries might raise a few flags. Plus, you do have the economic downturn in the late 1920s going through to the early 30s, which would mean, again, that if you have a, even a private industry, whether that be the Ansaldo or Mitsubishi or whatever, who are, maybe are happy to take on a German engineer or two, well, when the profits start going down and, you know, we just think about the bottom line, who's going to go out the door first? Are you going to chuck out your own engineers who are needed to help you design ships for your own Navy? Or are you going to chuck out the transfer guy? Especially since, again, before the formal alliance, what exactly can you have them working on? Because there will be issues of national security involved. Philip Allard asks... How did the Navy put together the crews for all of these builds? Presumably this is the US Navy. There could not have been that many trained navigators and other specialists just sitting around in 1943. Well, there's actually quite a complex system when it comes to strengthening well, the US and Royal Navies, both of which are obviously undergoing some fairly major expansion during World War II. So firstly, you have the regular crews of your ships. And whilst... In peacetime, you might have several officers, for example, trained in navigation or some other kind of specialization. You always want to have some redundancy built in, obviously. So you've got to have at least, let's say for navigation, you've got to have at least one navigating officer who's able to stand each watch. You probably want at least one or two who are trained in that capability in case anyone gets sick or injured. And you've also got the more senior officers who might have had that position previously, who have now gone on to high echelons of command, but are still present on the ship and have those skills. Once wartime comes, however, although having the redundancy is obviously quite attractive for things like, you know, if you get hit by enemy fire and casualties are caused, you can, in a pinch, decide that actually we're go we're going to minimize that number so you know maybe there's slightly fewer redundant officers with that skill aboard the ship because some of them have been assigned to new ships but there's a very limited amount that you can do with that short of you know saying to the, the captain or the first officer hey guess what you're also now just navigating the ship because your navigating officers have all gone off to other vessels then you have the reserves so depending on the navy you might have one or two levels of reserves and the reserves will obviously have people who have those specializations and skills so they're called up and you can mix them in with cadres of your current seamen and officers and so that will bulk up the numbers a bit you've then got the skilled volunteers so this will be either people who weren't in the reserves but maybe have been in the navy previously who are now coming back to the navy and you might also have transfers of skilled sailors from merchantmen coming across. So that will offer you even more people with specific uh, skills for engineering, navigation, gunnery, etc., etc. And all of those, once they're aboard ship, they can obviously help train others who are aboard ship in at least the basics and then later perhaps even some more advanced techniques which will expand the number of trained personnel that you have. And that will actually, between all of that, that will actually stretch a fair way. Plus, you have the schools that are teaching new recruits and later on conscripts who are coming up through the various educational lines that you might have. And they will also now have those skills. And in that regard, that's probably where your single greatest ongoing flow of specifically skilled sailors is going to come from. But a lot of that depends on when you opened the taps on the training. Because if you open the taps on the training when war broke out, you're going to be waiting several years before you get any kind of decent level of additional numbers with those skills coming out. Whereas if you've started the training before, so you've maybe first opened up your Navy to considerably more volunteer recruits, and then obviously as war goes on, maybe later on people are just getting drafted or conscripted, then that means you 
by the time war breaks out, if you've started two or three years earlier, you actually have a fairly large additional batch of people coming through the rat lines. And then obviously as the war goes on every year, you will have more and more people graduating into the fleet. So add all of those together and that's how you end up with the spe number of specialists that ideally you want as the Navy's numbers begin to explode. Prussian Hill asks, I was surprised to learn that the Imperial Japanese Navy defined a role for a light cruiser to serve as a support ship for submarines, even going as far as to develop the Oyoda class for the role, with the previous Agano class also being utilised in the role for a time. Online, it simply states that the Oyoda was obsolete upon completion, the remainder of the class cancelled, with Oyoda herself being converted towards other uses. How accurate is this assessment? It would seem like the doctrine itself changed, Japanese submarines being tied to a fleet rather than being used for commerce raiding, which makes it seem like the role ceased to exist rather than a deficiency of the ship. As originally designed, what do you think the viability of a purpose-designed submarine support cruiser, as opposed to an auxiliary cruiser or a milk cow, would have been in World War II? And do you think that Yoda herself would have been useful in that role? Yoda is, and Agana before her and her classmates, are kind of a response to Japanese sub-tactics and, as you said, an attempt to make them better. Because as far as the Japanese are concerned, they do not have the shipyard capacity, or really the money, to build vast fleets of light cruisers and heavy cruisers, the same way that the British and the Americans were. In the Japanese view, when they're looking at the Kantai Kesson Doctrine, big 8-inch armed heavy cruisers with extensive torpedo batteries are the kind of cruiser that their fleet needs because their fleet is being built for mainly one purpose which is to destroy the american fleet when it comes to try and interfere with their activities in the western pacific and as i said there just isn't the funding or the shipyard space to also be churning out a bunch of ten thousand ton six inch armed cruisers even if they do the megamis but of course we know that the megamis were supposed to be heavy cruisers it's just a sleight of hand for the purposes of taking boxes under the treaties but when it comes to submarines, well, the Japanese Navy has a very clear submarine doctrine. The submarines will be deployed in picket lines, and they will be deployed along the lines of approach for enemy fleets, and then they will attack those fleets, or squadrons, or whatever. So in some ways, it's not dissimilar to German wolf pack tactics, but with the German wolf pack tactics you need the need to radio your other subs or radio back to land and then radio to the subs or if you're lucky you maybe get a condor come along which will do some aerial recon for you and tell you where the attack targets are the japanese on the other hand as we know were not having the world's greatest amount of success with long distance radio communications uh, although they did have them to a degree plus the pacific is very 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 big and considering that they're planning on fighting the American fleet well away from Japanese shores, they're not really in a position to have some Condor equivalent, even an H-8K. You know, they're not going to be able to, A, reach out far enough to have a meaningful patrol distance at the ranges the submarines are expected to be operating at. And even if they were able to do that, their ability to actually communicate all of that back across multiple time zones and then get that communicated to the submarines all by radio is somewhat questionable so you then also have to factor in the fact that you know even if we're hand waving away and giving these planes magical range the pacific is so large how many aircraft have you actually got can you cover the relevant areas again probably not at which point if you know that you need some kind of recon that's better than just a sub saying, hey guys, I've actually found the enemy and I'm in the middle of either attacking them or being attacked, then you, you realise you need basically organic aerial recon. And the best and cheapest way to do that is to build a small cruiser with some limited self-defence capability that can see off you know, destroyers and so forth and station that as a submarine flagship and then the theory goes you use that it launches much shorter range recon aircraft but they're right there with the subs so they don't doesn't matter if they're short range and also being smaller they might be somewhat harder for the enemy to spot they can then report back to the cruiser the cruiser can then act as a shortwave radio station to communicate with the submarines 
and allocate the submarines to the correct attack vectors. Plus, it means that if the cruiser is spotted, the cruiser obviously has the speed and the guns to try and at least run away, whereas a submarine that's spotted is on the surface is going to be much, much easier of a target. So it minimizes the risk to the submarines. The problem, which is why Yoda, yes, in her originally designed role, is a bit obsolete right from the beginning of her time in service and why she does get converted, is essentially radar. I mean, yes, numbers and the, where the war is going for Japan at the time Oyoto enters service also have something to do with it, but radar is the single biggest problem because radar allows the spotting of recon aircraft much, much easier. Radar also means the spotting of individual ships is much, much easier, and for that matter, the spotting of subs. And that means that whereas in the 1930s, when the concept for the Aganos and the Oyotos is being envisaged, actually finding a backstopping fast small cruiser that can run away which would all have to be done visually would be very very difficult by the time a is in service you know even if the japanese submarine arm was as capable as it had as it was at the start of the war and even if the americans hadn't built every single person's pet warship and even if the Japanese Navy hadn't been hammered six ways from Sunday numbers-wise, etc., 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 and even if the Allies hadn't pretty much figured out how the Japanese ran their sub-campaign. Even all that aside, Oyoda would have been far, 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 far too easy to either detect directly or track back and then detect using radar and radio direction finding. So, yeah, she would have been very effective in a late 1930s war, at least some to a certain degree but in world war ii especially by mid world war ii it's not a particularly useful role for her the man formerly known as commenting is what i do asks i recently found out about how the americans are at actually continue to produce m1 abrams tanks without respite despite having a surplus of the parts in order to keep the factories running why didn't any nation employ a similar method for any aspect of capital ship building such as guns armor engine parts etc during the Washington Naval Treaty or other similar periods? Was there anything stopping them from just making more unassembled weapons just to keep the production lines up and running, rather than just stopping outright how they did historically and losing some of their capability? There were three main factors that mitigated against this. Cost, obsolescence, and treaties. The treaties is the slightly weaker one because there's nothing specifically in the treaty that says you can't manufacture armor plate and guns and all these other kind of bottleneck parts for your capital ships. But given that you're not supposed to be building any battleships and you're continuing to mass manufacture the key critical items that, as I just said, will bottleneck the production of capital ships and you're stockpiling them, that might lead to a number of other treaty signatories looking at you in askance and going, why are you exactly stockpiling all of these? Could it be that you're planning on suddenly in enacting a burst of capital ship construction to get ahead of everyone? Because if you are, that would be exactly what you'd be doing in advance of it, because building hulls can be done very, very fast. Building guns and armor, not so much. So if we're then trying to catch up with you and we have to bulk order all of our weapons it's going to take a while for us to develop and get them all running whereas for you you could be chucking out a hull ev hulls every year from your slipways and building up a very large fleet so we're very suspicious of you and we'd like you to please stop or else and you know that's a factor especially obviously for the interwar period with the naval treaties in place the bigger issues however as i mentioned are obsolescence and cost firstly manufacturing that amount of steel for you know face hardened armor plate is incredibly expensive and also manufacturing high precision instruments like the guns very very expensive and as i mentioned a few times in the other answers to the, in this video you know there were fairly significant periods of the interwar period when navies weren't just keen to cut budgets generally but there was the great depression going on and navies were having their budgets cut even more than they wanted so unnecessarily producing spare material 
would again have been the first thing to go also armor plates have to be shaped somewhat to the hull of the ship that they're going to be installed on and unless you're planning on constructing copies of ship designs that by the end of the treaty period which by the washington treaty is going to be at least into the early 1930s you know ship design will have moved on by then so unless you're planning on building exact replicas of your now obsolete ship designs then there's a very little point in manufacturing large piles of armor plate you know if if you design armor plate to fit the nelson class well who says that that's the thickness of armor plate you're going to have same with the colorados how do we know that that's the exact thickness of armor plate that we're going to want on our next capital ship and do we want the whole form to be the same so do we want the armor plates to fit that whole form again probably not and the same thing with the guns um so this is kind of verging into the obsolescence issue not only is it incredibly expensive to do but what kind of guns do you manufacture do you if you're the us go well we've got the majority 14 inch in our fleet or the royal navy has a majority 15 inch or the japanese also 14 so do we mass manufacture lots of those to maybe make logistics easier on our peacetime fleet but then when war breaks out we have a ton of 14 inch or 15 inch guns lying around but we know that the tree, uh, as per the treaty, the 16 inch is the biggest gun. So we're probably going to want 16 inch guns. So instead, do we build 16 inch guns in mass numbers for ridiculous amounts of supply to our two or three 16 inch armed ships? But then again, you know, given that we were designing 18 inch ships before the treaty came in, will we maybe need 18 inch guns? We can't build 18 inch guns now. But we might want to and regardless of whether we're building 14 15 16 or 18 inch guns will these guns be the cutting edge of technology when we have to start building capital ships or will they be largely useless so in the end whilst in theory keeping the large supply line of weaponry and components available seems like a good idea especially in terms of maintaining the skills unfortunately you are looking if you're a, the admiralty or the government at a very very expensive production run of things that you hope you're probably never going to need bear in mind obviously if everyone was talking about the world war one at the time being the war to end all wars anyway and you will end up with a bunch of very expensive objects which probably won't fit anything that you actually want to build when it comes time to go to war may well be somewhat obsolete and will have cost you a huge amount of money which could otherwise have been put into preserving your existing fleet which especially with the great depression around would be much much more of a priority to everybody so unfortunately it's, it just comes with too many cost factors that are that mitigate against it Giroro Mech asks, what kind of damage could a super firing gun have done to the lower one that necessitated an overhang? Was there really a risk of incapacitating it? So it's not so much the gun itself you have to worry about, it's the crew. So these gun mounts are still open at the back and you can also see there's sighting hoods on the top which are either going to be open or only protected by glass which is probably not going to stand up to particularly high amounts of pressure. And the crew are obviously a little squishy. Now, you will recall the pressure diagram that I've shown a few times before from a 16-inch Iowa-class battleship's gun. However, whilst the exact pressures might vary, the shape is applicable. So let's have a look at that now. Now, bearing in mind that you're talking about getting fairly nasty hearing damage from overblast pressure, um, or blast overpressure, I should say, at about 15 psi, and then you're trending up to about 100% fatalities at 50 or so PSI or just over, and in between 15 and 50, you have a graduating degree of increasing ear damage, organ damage, and then death, depending on exactly what's going on. And then you, again, admittedly looking at a much bigger gun, but you can see that the, you know, the radius for blast effects at 15 PSI is, you know, 30 40 feet to the side of the gun barrel <laughs> and uh, the height of this gun barrel on cavalier 
is decidedly much, much less than that. I mean, if that gun it was firing mostly horizontal in a close range action, then you're talking about a, a distance between the a crew's head for the you know, the head of a crewman on the lower gun and the barrel of the upper gun of maybe five to six feet, if you're lucky. Now, even if you scale down those pressures from a 16-inch gun to, in this case, a four and a half inch, at five to six feet, that's still going to badly discombobulate the crew, especially with repeated exposures, and it could do a lot worse. So that's why that plate is there. It's to deflect the worst of the blast, or most, if not all of it, then hopefully the roof of the gun mount will take care of much of what's left. So it's still not going to be a pleasant experience to be standing on the A mount whilst the B mount fires directly over your head, but it's going to be a survivable one, and one that you hopefully won't come away with with, with too much in the way of organ or hearing damage, as opposed to without that being there, you could be in some very, very serious problems. Matt Kidd asks, in the film Master and Commander, Jack is shown to take a large and active role in midshipmen's education and development. Would the captain of a Royal Navy warship typically take such a role in the training of midshipmen? As with all of the good questions, the correct answer is maybe. It's a very variable thing. Back in the Age of Sail, as I've mentioned in previous answers, exactly what a captain is supposed to do other than command his ship is a much more nebulous concept than it is these days. And the size of the ship will also play a certain role. So if you're talking about a big ship of the line like Victory, there may be dozens of midshipmen aboard, and the captain is somewhat removed from them through several layers of officers. At which point, whilst the captain, if he's a good captain, may take some interest in helping with the midshipmen's education and development, People wouldn't be massively surprised if he didn't or he offloaded that duty to one of or more of the lower ranking officers because the captain's going to have a lot of other things to do and there's only so many hours in the day and a lot of midshipmen to talk to. Um, conversely, on something like the Surprise, which is a relatively small ship with relatively low numbers of midshipmen and not so many layers of officers between them and the captain at that point the captain is going to have to get to know his midshipmen much much more closely if he wants his command to be successful and combined with the fact as i said earlier that there are just fewer of them a good captain at that stage most likely will take an interest in the progression of his midshipmen of course a bad captain an indifferent captain whatever is still relatively unlikely to pay much more than the absolute minimum required attention. But someone like Jack Aubrey on a ship like Surprise, it would not be unheard of. In fact, it would probably be fairly typical for a captain of his calibre on a ship with his complement to ensure that his midshipmen were the best that they could be. And that includes training them so that they can pass their lieutenant's exam. Because a lot of the stuff that's in the lieutenant's exam, like navigation and ship handling, will have a direct impact in what they're capable of doing whilst the ship is in action or whilst the ship is just generally cruising before they take that exam, which of course then improves the capabilities of the vessel for its performance in battle and just generally. Nathan Formosa asks, what's the definition of a casement, turret or barbette style gun layout? There are essentially two separate elements there so casements are a little bit separate from barbettes and turrets the casement is an armored sponson would be the best way to describe it down the side of a ship whether that be the side of the superstructure the side of the hull or whatever so in this picture which is hms emperor of india undergoing um, healing trials you can see the secondary battery the six inch guns there are mounted in casements down the side so you can see each one sticks out of the hull a little bit and there is an armored gun shield and a little bit of armor around there as well but just facing outwards and on something like say an omaha class cruiser you have casements mounted in the superstructure and sometimes you can get double height casements where you know as the name suggests there's a casement on one deck and a casement on the deck above on some u.s 
battleships of the standard type, the casements were moved up after the New Mexico's out into the superstructure completely and so on and so forth. So a casemate, ba a battery or gun layout, as said, involves armoured gun shields emplaced within a structure on the sides of a ship. That's opposed to deck guns, which might have an armoured gun shield, but are not embedded in a structure overall. Now, barbette and turret layouts, well, normally they're on the centre line, but as was proven by anything from HFS Invincible down to Inflexible, down to Italia, the Ironclad, um, and Inflexible is also an, an Ironclad, they don't have to be centre line, and they don't even, strictly speaking, in the case of some of the earlier Ironclads, don't even have to be on the upper decks. <laughs> they can be lower down with a flying deck above and hull, hull structure fore and aft of them. But both of them rely on a barbette. So a barbette is an armoured cylinder, which the base of the gun and possibly part of the gun and possibly part of the ammunition system sits in, depending on how deep the barbette is. In some ironclads of the latter part of the 19th century, this was the main armament. So you'd have essentially an armoured bowl or armoured cylinder, but the gun and the crew would be exposed above and partially to the side, depending on exactly how partially depended on exactly what kind of gun it was. So on, say, the Royal Sovereigns, for instance, the guns were semi-recessed into the barbette. On the 16.25 inch mounts that were put on things like the Admiral Class HMS Benbow, uh, it was considerably more exposed. But the idea of the barbette was to prevent damage to the gun's potentially elevating mechanisms, the ammunition storage, and maybe some of the crew, but splinter damage explosives or direct hit to the gun or crew was still possible through the open top nature of it. A turret as we understand it these days is an armoured gun house that is built around the guns on top of a barbette and rotates with the guns to provide shelter for the guns themselves, the ammunition that's being loaded into them and the crews. So that's why you need in the modern parlance a turret and a barbette are very similar because one relies on the other. Now, before either the barbette or the turret, as we understand it these days, there was a slightly earlier version of the turret, which was just usually a big armoured cylinder, kind of like a barbette, but elevated higher up, so it shielded the gun and the crew, usually with an armoured roof as well. So you see this on something famously like USS Monitor. But... It was not, strictly speaking, required for this turret to have any armour present below the level that the guns were mounted on, so it didn't necessarily have a barbette the way that later gun turrets would. And so you have these two very different classifications of gun turrets involved. And what you can see here on Emperor of India is the latter type, the more modern turret, where you have the cylindrical barbette with the gun turret resting on top of it, with the guns mounted within the turret and everything rotating on top of the barbette. Ferris asks, given that George Lucas was a student of history and a fan of the accounts of World War II combat, what do you think his inspiration was for the Millennium Falcon? A PBY Catalina, a PT boat, a Q-ship, something else, or a bit of a mishmash? I don't think there's a direct World War II equivalent to the Millennium Falcon, personally. I mean, if the Millennium Falcon was a warship um, or a, a military vessel, either directly in the service of the Empire or directly in the service of the Rebellion, for that matter. I mean, I know she is later on, but originally she's a private vessel. As a private vessel, it, it doesn't really fit anything within World War Two. And you know, the examples you mentioned, Catalinas and PT boats, they are vessels of war, aircraft of war, they're in service with um, various militaries, whereas the Millennium Falcon is, well, in Star Wars, is a light freighter operated by a private individual, but heavily armed, uh, for, especially for its size. Pretty quick as well, um, and then later capable of being brought into military service, as you see in basically Return of the Jedi, um, a little bit in 
Empire Strikes Back, I guess. Now, some elements of Star Wars have been described as Age of Sail in space, much as Star Trek to a certain degree has in some of its formats. And I think if, although, yes, you know, the, the Death Star Trench run, most of the Starfighter combat, etc., all of that is very directly inspired by World War II aerial combat. And as most Star Wars fans will know, a lot of it in the original trilogy was inspired almost by directly taking from gun camera footage from the Second World War. When it comes to something like the Millennium Falcon, the, the best naval analogy I can come up with for it is probably going to be a blockade runner dash privateer now we know that at least in mainline star wars canon that um han solo and the falcon aren't they are not pirates um, but they're not adverse to you know defending themselves or seeing people off of things that they see is rightfully theirs hence the kind of the mishmash they're smugglers the best way of coming up with armed smuggler in a very fast vessel is basically a, yeah as i said a privateer dash blockade runner in the context of a military conflict um, in pure peace times it would just be straight up smuggling but you're you'd kind of be looking at a late 18th early 19th century um, small high value vessel so actually in some ways uh, an american tea smuggler from just before the war of independence or a confederate blockade runner if you want to look at that maybe a, uh, a prussian blockade runner from the franco-prussian war all of those kinds of examples would be broadly applicable to the millennium falcon you know, small heavily armed fast under private ownership not afraid of shooting at a few people here and there rob smith asks what was prince eugen doing during the battle of denmark strait and when it was over how did she manage to evade the prowling british cruisers and destroyers on her way back to germany at Battle of Denmark Strait, Prince Eugen was blazing away at Hood for the most part, as well as listening very carefully on hydrophones, uh, basically supporting Bismarck in her attempts to destroy the British forces as fast as humanly possible, because, well, they knew they were being trailed by Norfolk and Suffolk, and they were perfectly aware that if Norfolk and Suffolk actually you know, managed to get in within gun range, and they were doing their level best to do so, then they'd be in a much worse situation, because Although Prince Eugen's 8-inch shells couldn't really do significant damage to either Prince of Wales or Hood, they could degrade those ships' fighting capabilities, hence the supporting fire. Whereas once Norfolk and Suffolk showed up, Prince Eugen would have to dedicate herself to trying to hold those off for as long as humanly possible. Once the battle was over, Prince Eugen was detached from Bismarck, because remember, Bismarck took damage during the battle, and they knew they weren't going to be able to stay at sea for as long as they'd wanted to. It took him a couple of tries, but Prince Eugen was eventually able to be detached without the British initially realising that she'd gone. And once they realised that she had gone, then obviously for the next few days, the priority was finding and killing Bismarck, because Bismarck, they didn't know exactly how badly it was damaged, but... In any case, Bismarck, if it showed up and attacked a convoy, could deal with basically any escort that any convoy had, um, barring maybe Rodney or Nelson. And compared to that, Prince Eugen couldn't. Prince Eugen would have to back off if any battleship was present, even if it was an old R-class. And although Hipper had engaged Beric during a convoy action realistically speaking if prince eugen came across a heavy cruiser or even a couple of light cruisers escorting a convoy she'd have to back off from there anyway because whilst she may or may not win that engagement she almost certainly would take damage and that would put paid to her career as a raider so it better to go off and find something less well defended but as a result, you know, as we said, everyone's obsessed with finding Bismarck, which means that Prince Eugen is well away from the last point anyone re knew where she was from the Allied side of things by the time Bismarck is sunk. And around about the time that Bismarck is sunk, she starts to experience significant engine problems and has to head home for, well, quote unquote, home. She has to head for occupied France. 
And in the immediate aftermath of Bismarck sinking, which is kind of when the Allies can actually start paying attention to trying to track down where on earth Prince Eugen has got to, well, a lot of the ships that have been involved in the chase have had to skedaddle home for fuel, so they're out of the equation, and the remaining ships have no real reference point as to where to start looking for Prince Eugen, and given that she's making a beeline for home, she's only at sea for four, maybe parts of five days between Bismarck being sunk and actually making it into Brest. Matt Blom asks, Given Canada's large naval expansion in World War II, with a particular focus on convoy escort, why was an effort not made to produce or procure escort carriers for this role? Instead, the focus was on smaller surface combatants, only obtaining a couple of light carriers towards the end of the war. The essential problem was that there's a very different skill set to operating an escort carrier, or carrier of any description really, as compared to operating an anti-submarine warfare craft, especially when you're talking about you know, frigates, corvettes, destroyers. These things in World War II do not tend to have aircraft of any description, whereas an escort carrier is all about its aircraft. Now, the Canadians did kind of operate a couple of escort carriers, HMS Nabob and HMS Puncher. Uh, Nabob seen here not having the most brilliant of days. But even then, although the carriers themselves had a mostly Canadian crew, the air element, and this being the harder of the two elements to actually fill, that was almost entirely fleet air arm from the British aspect of the Royal Navy because for the Canadians to operate an escort carrier entirely on their own would have meant they'd need to get hold of aircraft for a start, you know, albacore, swordfish, whatever they wanted to stick on the escort carrier. They'd also have to come up with a pilot corps for naval operations. Now, yes, there was the Royal Canadian Air Force, but as any Air Force or Navy pilot will tell you, there is quite a few differences in the training between an uh, aircraft carrier pilot and an air force pilot so they would have had to establish their own version of the fleet air arm and of course it would have been a very small element because even a couple of escort carriers you're talking about needing maybe a couple of dozen pilots maybe a few more maximum and that's an awful lot of the time and expense to go through to get a very, very small pilot corps when, you know, actually focus your time, effort and money on just training more and more ship's crew, mostly for your anti-sub escorts, somewhat for operating aboard the escort carriers as general ship's crew, and then leave the much larger fleet air arm to the problem of actually training and operating the air, the air crew. Of course, as you mentioned, towards the end of the war, you do have uh, Magnificent and Bonaventure eventually. But as they are considerably larger carriers, you can, at that point, if you want to have carriers going into peacetime, justify having an establishment where you do train naval pilots, although obviously there's still a bit of cross-training going on as well, because the air group is self-sustaining. It's large enough to be a self-sustaining unit at that stage. Togfather asks, King George V commissioned on October 1st, 1941, and was operational with the Home Fleet by the end of the year, less than three months later. However, Prince of Wales was still not 100% ready when she sailed to engage Bismarck four months after her commissioning. I would have expected King George V, as the leadership of the class, to have had more teething troubles, so why did Prince of Wales take longer to get up to speed? Was there a bottleneck in supplying her full crew complement, or did Camel Laird complete her with more defects than Vickers Armstrong did with King George V, or was it something else? Prince of Wales basically had a couple of bits of bad luck while she was under construction. Firstly, her, both her and King George V were obviously still under construction when war broke out, so the first thing was accelerate construction. That's always going to have a few issues. But combined with the accelerated construction... Prince of Wales, unlike King George V, had some delays to the um, delivery of her gun mountings. So although when you look at the dates of the ships being laid down, the dates of their launch and the dates of their commission, it seems to be roughly in sync. For Prince of Wales, she had that delay for getting her main armament fitted, 
um, which meant that it was installed at a later date along that timeline than it would have been on King George V, which would have meant there'd be less time between installation and commissioning for all the issues to be worked out. And then she was also bombed while she was still part way through fitting out which obviously caused a bunch of damage caused a bunch of flooding that all had to be rectified and then she had to be repaired which put even more delays onto things so in the end she was actually realistically should have been another two or three months under fitting out before commissioning but because of the need for capital ships at the time she was basically rushed into commission even though a bunch of tests and so forth hadn't yet been done so she was technically operational but realistically thanks to the delay she'd suffered from late deliveries and and the bombing she in peacetime would have spent another two three maybe even four months in dock um, catching up with the delayed work rather than going straight into commission so as she proved at the battle of denmark strait she was technically combat capable um she was mostly there but there were a few issues to to work out which by that stage in her, her equivalent career king george v did not have and that's it for this video thank you very much for watching everybody the dry dock has now ended and it is time to see you again in another video later on this month bye